When you come into Geneva, you're walking through the crossroads of history. Religion and culture have collided here for centuries. Switzerland's most cosmopolitan city once served as the cutting edge of the Reformation. This magnificent Gothic structure, St. Peter's, changed from a Catholic cathedral to a Protestant church in 1536. It was here that John Calvin preached his message and reshaped a whole city. Switzerland's proud tradition of neutrality led to Swiss bank accounts. Geneva has many times been the safest place in Europe. And so the wealth of nations often pass through its financial institutions. The International Red Cross started here. The League of Nations found a home in this city. These were some of our noblest attempts to bring peace and healing among peoples. Even today, that tradition continues at the Palace of Nations. As part of the United Nations, it hosts 7,000 conferences a year and has become the largest center for multilateral diplomacy in the world. Geneva, above all, has served as a place of refuge for the persecuted. The English fled here from Bloody Mary. Huguenots from the wrath of Louis XIV, Spaniards from the Inquisition, and the Waldenses from bloody persecution. Geneva has been a symbol of hope for so many, a promise of a place of lasting peace. You can sense it in the waters of Lac Le Mans that stretch from the city to the Alps surrounding it. A grandeur is mirrored here, which beckons us and makes us wonder if there really is a better world that can touch each one of our lives. It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Mark Finley. Looking Beyond. The Waldenses were one of the main groups who came here to Geneva and to this church, seeking the right to worship as their consciences dictated. They came from the mountains of northwest Italy and they caused quite a stir. The Calvinist reformers began to learn their story and realize that these people had been preaching Reformation truths for hundreds of years. Suddenly, the reformers had an honorable genealogy. They had spiritual ancestors. Now, when Catholic inquisitors asked them where their religion was before Luther and Calvin, they could point to the Waldenses, a people who cherished a pure scriptural faith from earliest times. But there was something else equally remarkable about this group of refugees. They had held on to this faith while enduring centuries of persecution. They'd been driven from their homes in France and Italy. They'd been ostracized. They'd been attacked. Their children were sometimes taken from them. At times, they'd endured horrible massacres. But there they were, still clinging to their faith in the basic truths of the gospel. How did they do it? How did they persevere? How did they endure as a people and become known as the legendary Israel of the Alps? That's what we're going to explore in this final program in our series, Faith Against the Odds. I believe their secret will help us find a way to persevere through difficulties in our own lives. First, let me tell you one of the things that stands out about the persistence of the Waldenses. You don't see a people who are grimly hanging on to their faith against the odds. What you see very often is people who displayed remarkably good cheer in the face of persecution. Something kept their spirits up, even when the world was crushing them down. The story of John Lager is a good example. He is known as the great historian and advocate of the Waldenses. But in 1620, he was just another student here in Protestant Geneva. Sometimes he had come to this shore for a break from his books. One day, 
a young prince bathing in the lake got tangled up in some weeds and was trapped underwater. Bystanders screamed for help. A boat was launched, but it couldn't get through the matted reeds. And no one wanted to risk swimming into that trap. No one, that is, except young Jean Leisure. He fought to free the prince, almost drowning himself in the process, and managed to drag him to a sandbank. The prince was profoundly grateful, of course, and he took a great liking to Leisure. He urged the student to accompany him on his travels. This was a great opportunity to make all the right connections. But Leisure decided to keep preparing for a nobler profession. He wanted to pastor Waldensian congregations in the mountains. And so in 1639, Jean Leisure made his way back home to these Piedmont valleys in northwest Italy, where his people had celebrated a New Testament faith for many generations. He knew he'd be facing many hardships. He barely survived that first trip. He had to sneak past the lines of armies who were besieging the city of Turin. Once he escaped patrols only by holing up in a deserted farm for days. Later, he would joke to friends that his horse ate a lot better than he did. And that was just the beginning of a life of narrow escapes. As a pastor here, Jean Leisure often had to keep an eye out for the long arm of the Inquisition. But he still managed to preach four sermons a week. Soon he was asked to take reports about what was happening here to Geneva and the outside world. Leisure remained a pastor on the run. He made dangerous crossings over the Alps in winter. He survived assassination attempts. He once had to eat icicles for two days while hiding out in an abandoned barn. In 1655, after another terrible massacre, Leisure managed to make his way back to Geneva. And here he began awakening the world to the plight of the Waldenses and the terrible injustices they were still suffering. Leisure knew about danger and persecution and atrocity. He knew it firsthand. But you know something else stands out in this man's journal, in the record he left us of his travels. He seemed to always take the hardships with good humor. He still managed to enjoy life. He always looked on the bright side. That was a distinguishing mark of many Waldenses. They weren't overwhelmed by bigotry and humanity all around them. They rose above it. Some of the inquisitors themselves recorded their amazement at the calmness and serenity on Waldensian faces in their last moments before facing death. So let's try to find out how they could face death without fear. What exactly did these believers absorb in mountain chapels like this one in Torre Palici that gave them such resilience, such good spirits in spite of it all? I think we can zero in on the most important factor. It's what we might call their ability to look beyond. The Waldenses were consistently able to look beyond the persecutions around them to something else. Their entire movement was pointed toward a heavenly kingdom. It was that way in the beginning when Peter Waldo and his followers began to spread the New Testament gospel to all who would listen. They saw themselves as trying to fulfill Christ's great commission. It's given in Matthew chapter 28 and verses 19 and 20. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The Waldenses were motivated to spread the good news everywhere, and they did it under Christ's command to the end of the age. Their mission was clearly pointed in that direction, clearly pointed toward a kingdom in heaven. This driving force shines out in the epic doctrinal poem of the Waldenses called The Noble Lesson. This is where all their beliefs are laid out. The Noble Lesson begins on an apocalyptic note. Most anxious should we be to do good works, for we see this world approaching its end. Daily we see the signs fulfilled. The Waldenses believed they were living in the time of the Antichrist. But the noble lesson states with confidence that those who receive dishonor in this life for the Lord's sake will have great glory in the next. The poem ends with a reference to the final judgment and the separation of the sheep and goats, the righteous and wicked. It says, God grant that on that day our place be found on the right hand of the just judge forever and ever. The coming kingdom of heaven provided a framework for all that the Waldenses believed, and it was this that gave them the ability to look beyond their present troubles. It gave them resilience. It kept their spirits up for centuries. One of the unique principles the Waldenses clung to starting back in the 12th century was nonviolence. In an age when churchmen justified all kinds of wars, crusades, and even massacres, these people were essentially pacifist. Now it's true that sometimes under intense persecution they fought to defend themselves, but as a general rule, the Waldenses stood for nonviolence. Why did they do that? because they tried to base their lives on the explicit teaching of Christ and his apostles. Take what Jesus said to Pilate, for example, after his arrest, reading from John chapter 18 and verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus wasn't trying to establish a political kingdom. He didn't want to be a political ruler of Jerusalem or anywhere else. He had no turf to defend, and so he didn't ask his followers to defend him. He told Peter to put away the sword when he tried to use it. The Waldenses took Jesus at his word. They believed in that other kingdom, that kingdom not of this world. So they looked beyond. They looked beyond the persecution around them. They looked beyond the political maneuvering around them, and they focused on that better world. The fact is, the Church of the Middle Ages had mostly lost sight of that coming kingdom. 
It was too busy trying to defend its own considerable kingdom on Earth. It was too busy defending its own interests. This church is known as San Pietro in Vincoli, St. Peter in Chains. It's most famous for the monumental statue of Moses carved by Michelangelo. The artist sculpted it for the tomb of his patron, Pope Julius II. This pope hoped to build an imposing monument to himself with dozens of statues. It was to stand 40 feet tall when installed in St. Peter's Basilica, but the tomb was never completed. Julius' successor as pope had other plans for Michelangelo. The church at Rome invested an enormous amount in monuments, in ornaments, in splendid ceremony. And the irony is that these things can get in the way of what they intend to honor. The symbol can obscure the real thing. We have a hard time seeing beyond it. The major relic housed in this church is a set of chains kept in a crystal urn under the main altar. These are reputed to be the chains that bound the Apostle Peter while he was imprisoned in Jerusalem by the Romans. In the Middle Ages, pilgrims came here by the millions to visit the chains, to pray before the chains, and to light candles to the chains. The Church of Rome conferred special powers on these chains that had miraculously dropped from Peter's hands. But that same church was busy putting people like the Waldenses in chains all over Europe. The same church that revered the Mamertine prison where Peter was kept was throwing heretics in prisons all over Europe. It was trying to establish its kingdom by the sword. No wonder it was hard for most believers to look beyond all of this to the kingdom in heaven. But the Church of the Waldenses was looking beyond the present. The people forced to worship in the forests and crevices and caves of these mountains had their eyes fixed on a better place. They didn't have Peter's chains, but they had Peter's perspective. They understood what he was saying in his second epistle when he talked about the second coming of Jesus Christ, when he described it as an event that separates what is of ultimate value from what isn't. Peter pictures the elements melting away and the heavens disappearing with a roar. Then he says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 11 and 12, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Everything is going to be burned up. Everything material will disappear. Only godly lives will count in the end. Relics won't count. Ceremonies won't count. Gold and silver won't count. Even beautiful cathedrals won't count. It's all going away. The Waldenses saw that clearly. And that's precisely why they persevered so heroically. They could go the distance. They were light on their feet. They weren't weighed down with ecclesiastical baggage. They weren't encumbered with all the accessories of religion. They looked beyond all these things to what mattered most, the coming kingdom of Christ. What kind of faith makes it through the hard times? A faith that travels light, a faith that rejoices in the kingdom that's coming. Listen to these words from Psalm 96 and verses 11 to 13. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. The psalmist can barely contain his excitement. The prospect of his Lord's return makes him exult. All nature seems to be celebrating before his eyes. He's looking beyond to God's kingdom. That's the kind of joy and the kind of confidence that the Waldenses shared. People need a kingdom that's going to last. We need something we can center our lives around through thick and thin. In the heart of every human being, is a longing for something eternal. Even the pagans in ancient Rome had to express that longing. History speaks to us from these Roman ruins. 
2,000 years ago, this Roman Forum was the center of the Roman Empire. Decisions made here changed the course of world events. These ruins in the Forum are all that's left of the place where the Caesars once ruled the world. But in the Empire's heyday, Romans passionately believed that their city was eternal, and they went to great lengths to keep that faith alive. That's why the cult of the Vestal Virgins was established. Their role was to tend the city's sacred flame in the Tempio di Vesta. The symbol of Rome's eternal character must never go out. If any Vestal Virgin ever allowed the flame to die, she was to be whipped by Rome's pagan high priest, the Pontifex Maximus. The role of the Vestal Virgins was so important, they enjoyed special privileges granted to few others. Any injury inflicted on them was punishable by death. They could even ride in the carriages through Rome, something usually granted only to an empress. Pagan Rome didn't have a kingdom of heaven, so they tried to create something eternal on earth. But today, of course, the Rome of the Caesars is only a few crumbling pillars and arches. All of us caught in the ups and downs of life need the ability to look beyond. We need something bigger and grander than the accessories. And only the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ is big enough and grand enough to capture our faith and to keep us looking up. The kingdom of heaven is what all these glorious cathedrals are pointing toward. Sometimes what the church does gets in the way. But we must, like the Waldenses, look beyond. We must fix our gaze on a better kingdom, on a better hope. It's a kingdom which will one day descend to this earth in dazzling glory. The apostle John saw it coming down. Let's look at Revelation chapter 21 and verses two to four. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. This is the promise Christ's empire is built upon. This is the hope that animated the Waldenses through centuries of persecution. And it is a blessed hope that can be ours as well. The Sabaud Monument near the town of Babio Polici marks an important event in the history of the Waldenses. It happened after Louis XIV ordered a bloody massacre in 1686. The Waldenses were almost wiped out. Many of the survivors died in prisons. A few managed to make it over the Alps to Switzerland. But remarkably enough, three years later, a pastor named Henry Arnaud led a group back across the mountains to their ancient homeland. It was an extraordinary feat of endurance. They had to battle harsh elements and hostile troops but they made it back to these valleys and then, every morning and evening, these people lifted up public prayers, sang psalms, and read the Bible together. Nothing on earth could snuff out their faith. The journey of the Waldensian exiles from France back to these Piedmont valleys is known as the glorious return. Historians believe that they came through this pass. But what's much more important is another glorious return which the entire history of the Waldenses points toward, the glorious return of Jesus Christ to claim those who are waiting for his kingdom. What are you waiting for today? What are you longing for today? Have you been distracted by some other kingdom on earth? Have you invested all your energies in something that's not really going to last? Are you trying to make something eternal that isn't? There's another way. There's a better place for your faith. You can have the hope that burns through the New Testament. You can share in that confidence, in that joy of the blessed hope. You can have the resilience of the Waldenses. You can persevere through the good and the bad. 
you can connect with something eternal, you can start experiencing all that right now as we pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for the example these remarkable men and women of faith have left us. Thank you for the possibility of looking beyond. We need that perspective in our lives. And so we choose right now to invest ourselves in your kingdom of heaven. Don't let anything dilute our resolve. Don't let anything overshadow our hope. We commit ourselves to follow Jesus Christ as Lord to the end of the age. In his name, amen. We all want answers to life's questions. We all need comfort and encouragement for our spiritual journeys. We're all looking for hope for the future. We're all together on the same planet with the same basic human needs. And God has direction for each of our lives. A good place to start your own spiritual journey is the It Is Written website at www.itiswritten.com. Here you'll find resources to enhance your walk with Christ. Go to the studies page and explore the Bible in three free online Bible studies. View weekly It Is Written programs through streaming online video. Catch up on shows you may have missed in the telecast archive section. View the scriptures used in the current week's program. Print out the script from a show you liked for future reference. Find out about upcoming programs and see when and on what channel It Is Written is airing in your city. Go behind the scenes and get a feel for the It Is Written production process. Be the first to find out when an event with Mark Finley or other live It Is Written programs are coming to your hometown. Get the latest It Is Written ministry news and developments. Learn more about the ministry and read the history of the show that's been impacting our world for God since 1956. It Is Written is a donor-supported nonprofit ministry. On the website, you can sign up to become an It Is Written partner and make a secure online donation to help us fulfill the Great Commission. Visit the It Is Written store and find pages of spiritual resources like videos, DVDs, audio tapes, books, music, Bible studies, and digital media products. Be confident in buying online with our secure ordering system. Have a prayer request? There's a place where you can tell us your concerns. There's so much here for you on the It Is Written website. We encourage you to make it a frequent companion on your spiritual journey. Get connected to the source that can change your world starting with you. Thank you for joining us for this last in our series of programs from Italy, Faith Against the Odds. As we think of the Waldenses coming over these mountains, returning home, our hearts long for our heavenly home. Until next time, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <laughs>